We are growing. And when people look at us and ask us, well, who are you? Are you just some white upper middle class guy who wants to get high and smoke your pot? Is that all it's really about? And my answer is partially yes. <laughs> but that's not my only answer because I have to tell you, this growing movement to end the drug war, it's not just those of us who enjoy our marijuana, enjoy our ecstasy and hallucinogens, even enjoy some other things, and do not have a problem with it, and do not cause problems for anybody else, and who resent the fact that we are treated as criminals for doing so. It is also the people who hate drugs. It is the people who have seen the worst that drugs can do, who are living with addiction, who have seen their children become addicted, and seen their parents as alcoholics, and have seen people dying of overdoses and living with HIV, who hate drugs, who believe in the gateway theory of drug use and marijuana use to other things, but who nonetheless believe that the war on drugs is not the way to deal with drugs and addiction in our society. And that it's not just those of us who care about drugs in that way or another, it's also people who don't give a damn about drugs. It's those of us who care about the Bill of Rights and the U.S. Constitution, and that nothing like the war on drugs has shoved back our fundamental liberties, at least until the war on terror, like has the war on drugs. It's those of us who care about the racial injustice of our prison system. It's those of us who call, call, care about putting cost-benefit calculations into the expenditure of taxpayer funds. It's those of us who care about what we're doing in Colombia and Mexico and the Caribbean and Latin America and Afghanistan, what have you. It's those of us, quite simply, that when you ask who is this emerging drug policy reform movement? I can tell you that we are the people who love drugs, we are the people who hate drugs, and we are the people who don't give a damn about drugs. But every one of us believe that the war on drugs is not the way to deal with the reality of drugs in our society. Now, the fact of the matter is, there has never been a drug-free society in human history, and there never will be one. Our challenge is not how do we keep drugs at bay, how do we build a moat between our children and these drugs. Our challenge is how do we learn to live with drugs, live with the reality of drugs, so that they cause the least possible harm and the greatest possible benefit. How do we do that in ways that are consistent with our values, our values about freedom and justice, fairness, and human rights? How do we do that? Now, I know that in this audience here, many of us are still afraid. We are afraid that even those of us who used to smoke marijuana and we look at our kids now, and why do we become hypocrites on the issue of drugs? It's not sometimes because we think our kids are going to do things that we never did. It's because we're afraid that our kids are going to do the same dumb things we did do, but they won't be so lucky. But that's not a basis for keeping the drug laws in place the way they are. I am astounded at times of the hypocrisy of the people that I went to college with and got high with, and now we all have teenagers, and oh my God, we sound like a right-wing reactionary when push comes to shove on this issue. The issue of removing marijuana from the criminal justice system, that has to be a progressive issue. When 40% of Americans now say it's time to treat marijuana like alcohol, when 50% of Democrats and independents and people under the age of 30 and approaching 50% in some Western states say it's now time to end the, the prohibition of marijuana, when Governor Schwarzenegger of all people is saying, I think it's time, but you look at the consequence. I mean, it's time. It is time to do it. It is time to do it. And when we look at the rest of the criminal justice system, I'm happy to see on Congress right now, I'm happy to see the movement to eliminate the crack powder disparity. I'm happy to see not just Democrats, but even Republicans begin to sign on this. I'm happy to see President Obama and Attorney General Holder saying the time is now, we're going to move forward on this. It took 20 years. It was a tragedy. It wasted uncountable numbers of lives. I'm happy to see that. But let's understand the more profound racial injustice of this drug war. Let's understand that when you look at the question about why so some drugs are legal and some are illegal today, it doesn't have to do with their relative risks. It doesn't have to do because some National Academy of Science panel was constructed 80 or 90 years ago and said, well, alcohol and cigarettes over here and marijuana and hallucinogens and cocaine over there. It's not about that. If you look at why we criminalize some drugs and not others, it had everything to do with who used these drugs. Who used these drugs? The first anti-opium laws in America 
We're not put in place when the average drug user was a middle-aged American woman taking opium and lauded him to deal with all the aches and pains. No, it was when the Chinese came. The first anti-opium laws in Nevada and California in the 1870s directed at the Chinese minorities. The first anti-cocaine laws in the South in the last century, 100 years ago, directed at black men and Negroes who people were afraid would take this white powder up their nose and forget their proper place in society. The first anti-marijuana laws in the Midwest and the Southwest in the teens and the 20s directed at Mexican Americans and Mexican migrants who would work those long hours, go back home, smell, smoke that funny looking reefer cigarette, and who knows in every case what those dark skinned people would do to our women and our children. Even quite frankly, alcohol prohibition was to some extent a struggle between the white white Americans and the not so white white Americans. Between the white white Americans coming from northern and western Europe in the 18th and early 19th century and the not so white white Americans flocking in from, the, from southern Europe Europe and Eastern Europe with their beer and their vino and their schlibblets. <laughs> it is about cultural struggle and we have perpetuated that to this day. The fact that the drug war and the drug laws were not just a bipartisan but a biracial movement, the fact that these horrific laws were supported not just by white members of Congress but by black members of Congress is no excuse not to dig deeply into this and to un uh, pull it out by its roots. But ultimately this is not just an issue of racial justice. This is not just an issue of fairness. Ultimately, this is about something else as well. And it's about a couple of words that I also am sorry that I did not hear once said on this morning's plenary. And then I have oftentimes sat through entire days of progressive meetings among people who I regard as my allies and not heard the word said. And what are those words? Liberty and freedom. Those words cannot be abandoned by the progressive movement in America. I have the unusual distinction of probably being one of the few people, if not the only, who's ever given a plenary at this organization and a plenary or two at CPAC, at the, Conser the Conservative Political Action Conference. And what I can tell you is what I'm interested in, in terms of building a movement around this is a movement that builds from the left and the right and the center. My own personal values may be at home in this community here, but I want to build upward and forward. I want the notions of fairness and compassion and human rights and science-based policy to always but always be linked with the core ideas of freedom and liberty. And I'll tell you, if we're looking about where young people care about and what young people in the campus and everywhere else are responding to, those words liberty and freedom mean something. In a society in which we have more and more criminalized more things, and which we continue to put regulations here and there, for good reasons, mind you, I support many of these regulations, but that to lose sight of that core element of human dignity and human freedom, and to use that language, is to see one of the items, one of the values, that is truly what has made this country great. And that is what underlies the Bill of Rights, and what is oftentimes best about the American Constitution. Now, I think that this growing drug policy reform movement, you know, we see ourselves today, we are a movement for individual freedom and for social justice. We see ourselves standing on the shoulders and following in the footsteps of other movements for freedom and social justice. The movement for, for gay rights and for women's rights and for civil rights and even the movement to abolish slavery and the slave trade. In every case, it's about perpetuating, promoting forward freedom and justice. In every case, it's about fighting against the vested interests in our society. And in our case, it's about articulating a core principle. And it's this. And I hope all of you will find ways to say it as you go about your lives in the days hereafter. I believe, and I hope you do as well, that nobody, but nobody, deserves to be punished simply for what we put in our bodies, absent harm to others. That nobody but nobody deserves to be punished for what we put in our bodies, absent harm to others. That is the fundamental core principle of moving forward. That as we push for alternatives to incarceration, as we push to reduce the role of criminalization, as we push to replace criminalization with sensible regulation, that core principle has to be there. It's on that basis that we can build a political movement for reform. And it's on that basis that I hope all of you who care about the campaign for America's future, <clears throat> about a progressive future, 
will please own and embrace this struggle that I and so many others are fighting for today. Thank you very much.